All right, welcome to Alpha Bunga Bunga. Alpha Bunga Bunga is Phil Cunliffe, George Hoare, and myself, Alex Hochuli. And today we're talking about something we don't talk about enough directly. Uh, it's American politics. Um, and in, one of the reasons that we don't talk about American politics that much is that many other podcasts cater for that kind of thing, talking about the ins and outs of politics. And some do it very well, including uh, Dead Pundit Society. So we're happy to be talking to Adam Proctor today. Hi, Adam. Hi, Alex. First time, long time. I've always wanted to say that. Yeah, Big excellent. And fan of Alpha Bunga Bunga. I like what you guys do, and I'm glad to be here. Well, the feeling's mutual, and actually, this is a, a very belated return invitation for Adam because uh, I've been on uh, Dead Pundits talking about Brazil. George has been on talking about Brexit. So we're very happy to have Adam on talking about American left politics. And particularly, uh, and this is, I guess, an attempt at being realistic and being honest about what the prospects, possibilities, and limitations are of the Bernie Sanders candidacy and democratic socialism uh, it, more broadly. So let's get started. Maybe this is a bit of a, one of these horrible softball questions, Adam, to get started. But if you could give us an overview of U.S. left politics, where we are right now, has 2020, the election cycle already begun? It feels like it's an interminable thing. Um, and it kind of permeates, people end up discussing it in, you know, in Britain, in Brazil, everywhere. And American electoral politics just seems to be uh, an interminable circus. And yet <clears throat> you kind of have to already start making your mind up about things. So maybe you could start telling us a little bit about where we are right now. Bearing in mind, we're recording this at the beginning of July. By the time listeners, you guys are listening to this, uh, it's probably a little bit later on. So nothing uh, too um, time sensitive. But yeah, if you could give us a little bit of an overview of where we are right now. Sure. I think... The, the first round of debates that we saw um, in late, uh, would have been late June. I think it was undoubted that Bernie Sanders won those debates, if not by virtue of his performance, which is kind of, you know, canned. Oh, I mean, Bernie's, he's a consistent guy, right? For better or for worse. He always sort of has the same spiel, the millionaires and the billionaires and all the rest of it. Um, but, but what he was able to do is really set the agenda of what was discussed uh, he really defined, you know, the the possible in terms of policies and rhetoric and the values that are presented on that that were presented on on, on those stages over the, the course of those two nights. So that's a tremendous victory for progressive and I would even say democratic socialist politics in a sense. With that being said, I think it remains to be seen whether or not Bernie is actually going to be able to capitalize on that success. Uh, we do know that the neoliberal wing of the Democratic Party is quite adept at co-opting progressive and radical messages for the, their own benefit, the benefit of their Wall Street you know, corporate donor class. And Joe Biden has already made a set of assurances behind closed doors that, quote, nothing will change. And that business as usual will go on should he be elected. And he still is quite uh, ahead in the polls. Um, if One thing that Joe Biden is quite good at doing is shitting the bed during debates. So uh, people forget that. They look at him as this kind of elder statesman, you know, this, this uh, you know, buddy comedy that was the, the, the Obama-Biden presidency for eight years. And they forget uh, that he completely shit the bed in 2008. And uh, 2004 as well during during the debate. So the more people see Joe Biden, the less they like Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. So we'll see how that shakes out in terms of the, the long term prognosis. In terms of the state of the U.S. left right now, I think we're, we're we're seeing a really interesting development. And it's one that in my mind is very welcomed. When I started Dead Pundit Society two and a half years ago, one of the central arguments I had to make, which almost seems comical now, is that, you know, guys, state power matters. It was an argument that I had to make over and over again. And it was one that at that time, at least on the socialist left and, and the radical left, was was quite controversial. Right. The fact that you would you would even need or that state power would be something that would be desired. And one thing that uh, these these various experiments and left populism across Europe and of course the Corbyn wave in the United Kingdom. And now the Bernie Sanders wave has demonstrated is that state power is absolutely essential. And although it's, you know, that that path is strewn with pitfalls and traps and contradictions along the way, uh, we've really got the deck stacked against us. Uh, capital can, controls the resources and flows of communication and all the rest of it. Just uh, just to in, just to interrupt, yeah, Adam. Um, sure. 
I'm just curious, what kind of pushback, I mean, what was the content of the arguments when people pushed back against you about state power? Was it like an Occupy style thing? Was it a kind of crazy Zapatista throwback? What did people say when you made the case for the need to to have political power? That's a good question. I think part of it was this kind of uh, Occupy vaguely anarchist zeitgeist that still predominated in that moment. I think much of it also was this uh, very abstract understanding of class and class formation. So this is even, you know, not anarchists. I'm talking about principled Marxists and socialists. We're of the belief that you should organize outside of the states in order to preserve this kind of true, uh, pure form of class power. And this is when debates were a lot more uh, live about you know, should socialists run on the Democratic Party ballot line, for example. And uh, while that's now become – there's a, a much higher degree of tolerance for socialists doing just that in terms of just uh, instrumentalizing the ballot line, for example. Uh, back then it was a much more contested, hotly contested question. And so I think uh, to answer your question more directly, it was, it was a question of what is the nature of class and can class – uh, can working class politics be organized outside of the state? Is the state necessarily ruling class in orientation? I think people are open now to a much more complex understanding of the way that the, the capitalist state uh, organizes classes. And so it's, a, it's an unavoidable venue if, if, if we want to, you know, uh, organize for socialism. So Adam, there's, there's, um, I think a, a question that follows on directly from this, which is, I guess, applying that class analysis to the, the upsurge that we've seen, um, on, on the British, on the American left. So who, who are the, um, what, 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 what's the social background of, I guess, some of these Bernie supporters? What are the, social bases of this um, of this upsurge. Now, Bernie support comes from a wide swath of of American society, uh, all classes, ethnicities, racial. I mean, he's heavily supported uh, by by racial and ethnic minorities, um, heavily supported in working class communities. But the real activist layer no, undoubtedly comes from this downwardly mobile millennial generation. Mm. Uh, people who, in terms of the jobs that they hold and the educations that they possess, would not be traditionally considered as working class. Now, that's a strength and a weakness. Yeah. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of, of comradely debate inside of the Democratic Socialist of America right now leading up to the convention that's going to happen later this summer about um, our uh, DSA's orientation to the labor movement, for example. Uh, should should socialists see themselves and it is the, as the organization as it exists as like sort of existing outside of the working class? Do we need mm -hmm. to link up with a working class that's out there? Or should we see ourselves as always already part of the working class? And we need to sort mm -hmm. of uh, see ourselves as workers. But to, but to answer your question, you go to a, an everyday a DSA meeting or our revolution meeting, you're going to see computer programmers. You're mm -hmm. going to see people with uh, master's degrees. You're going to see downwardly mobile people who are, are struggling with student debt, lack of health care access, uh, unaffordable housing. Things like that that uh, that really radicalize them, as opposed to, like I said, you say, of arriving at a union workplace, and, mm -hmm. and and radicalizing in that way, as you might have seen in previous generations. How easily is this block satiated? That's a good question. That's a really good question. Uh, you do wonder if if you have the PMC types, and I know you know have, being a, an avid listener of uh, Bunga, I know you guys talk about the prof professional managerial class quite a bit. You do wonder if they were able to get some some real standard bearing social democratic reforms if, if they would be placated a bit. Say get a Medicare for all plan. Say uh, get some serious debt relief in terms of student debt. Say you know some some reasonable jobs programs and some housing you know uh, reforms. You do wonder if 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 that wouldn't just be enough if we could get the economy up and cranking again. Um, which is, yeah, I mean, I think that's going to be that, – that'll, that'll carry us through the, the, the rest of our conversation today. Uh, right. Yeah, no, exactly. It will. So just one final piece of the puzzle before we actually start building up the case for Bernie and examining what the best case scenario for, for Bernie presidency would be. What is the role exactly of, of DSA, I guess? And this is mainly, I guess, for the benefit of our, of our non-U.S. listeners uh, who might not be so familiar with the ins and outs of it. 
uh, my answer here is is different today than it was uh, maybe six months ago, and certainly different than it was two years ago. Um, DSA, you know, they has benefited from concrete struggles on the ground. DSA is a very loosely federated uh, organization. Um, it's not a political party. It's uh, an, essentially a nonprofit, uh, something akin to a Rotary Club or a Lions Club or some other, you know, uh, social gardening <laughs> club, if, if you will, in terms of its legal form. I mean, to, just to get to be really blunt about it, uh, that's how they're organized legally. That's that's their relationship to broader society. Um, and so they're they're loosely affiliated local branches. And what they're really struggling with right now is is their identity. I mean, you have anarcho primitivist uh, caucuses that uh, proliferate inside of DSA. You have libertarian communists, so essentially, you know, class struggle anarchist pe- types, uh, anarchist syndicalists. You have uh, more traditional Trotskyists who have sort of had a come to Jesus moment with respect to electoral politics and Bernie. You uh, and you have much more kind of classic. Harringtonites who who harken back, you know, to, to the 1960s, the new, the the uh, the old new left, so to speak, and so they're having an identity crisis right now. But a lot of that is being clarified not only around the Bernie movement, but also these national campaigns, Medicare for all, and such. Their role in U.S. politics right now, I think, really remains to be seen. Uh, they take a lot of credit for Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, for example, for Rashida Tlaib, for some of these legislators that have been elected. It's unclear, and this is even true amongst uh, people inside of DSA who are, are well placed. It's unclear as to what extent DSA actually deserves um, ownership of of a lot of this stuff. Now, on the on the flip side, you see someone like Tiffany Caban, the mm. district attorney of Queens in New York City, tremendous uh, upset victory that that they just scored over there a couple of weeks ago. Um, that was very much DSA's doing, and so. It's uneven and combined, and I, I think it remains to be seen exactly what kind of impact they're going to have in the long term. Do you think there's a, a risk um, around DSA, specifically with relation to the Democratic Party? So the, the Democratic Party's got an extremely uh, deep and central um, rot to it, um, and I think this is one way that I've heard this, this danger posed, that the that DSA could essentially re-energize the Democrats providing <clears throat> moral legitimacy or moral cover to the to the Dems so being useful idiots in this in this in this sense do you think this is a danger I mean and maybe this is we'll talk about this more when we talk about the potential scenarios but is this something that DSA are already thinking through their potential relationship to the to the Dems and how this could um, potentially compromise them I think the DSA as an organization, both both collectively and, and the people who comprise it individually, are staunchly anti-establishment Democratic Party. So I'm not worried so much about that. Um, I'm also not so much worried about the actual politicians themselves. Uh, you see a lot of the people who are DSA endorsed, DSA affiliated, even loosely so, like AOC, for example, just openly, uh, you know, openly bucking the authority of Democratic Party elites. For example. Uh, the DCCC, which is uh, the you know kind of fundraising arm inside of the Democratic Party, working to get incumbents reelected and identify uh, various you know <clears throat> primary challenges that could be advantageous or whatever. Uh, they've notoriously cut off funding. They've they've threatened to cut off funding uh, to individuals who, sorry, they've blacklisted uh, consulting firms and, and and the rest of it who are working with people to. Uh, primary incumbents. So, for example, Justice Democrats, mm. Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, uh, you know, uh, was ushered into office by primarying Joe Crowley, who was the Speaker of the House in waiting, so to speak, which would have taken Nancy Pelosi's place, uh, quite likely, had he been victorious. And so, there, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of disobedience, I think, amongst the DSA affiliated. Politicians, so I'm not worried about them either. However, I, I think you're not wrong to be concerned that uh, the Pelosi's of the world are are quite um, they're quite crafty, mm-hmm. <laughs> and and it is possible that they may use the kind of 
the the undoubtedly sort of the moral strength that someone like Rashida Tlaib and AOC brought to the table when they visited these migrant these concentration camps, these migrant detention facilities, you know, a couple of weeks ago, it's undoubted the Democratic Party might try to latch onto that. Well, and and, and, and uh, claim it. It's also imaginable uh, that the defeat of these particular individuals and the Democratic Party establishment could still be a victory for the Democratic Party uh, in terms of its long-term existence. So it might turn into yeah. a more social democratic party um, right, and, right. and revive it <clears throat> and speak. But, you know, so I don't want to jump the gun here too much. So I, what I did want to get onto is start to build the case um, in terms of being realistic of what is the best case scenario. Let's like not think wildly here, but where, where does that, let's sketch, let's start, let's begin sketching out these scenarios. So Bernie, Obviously, the, the assumption here being that Bernie gets a nomination, Bernie wins the presidency, and then what, right? What, what happens on the, on the, what is it, the 20th of January when the American president gets inaugurated? And what is not just the state of play in, in terms of political institutions, but what's the state of play on the ground? And, and what, is the, what does the positive scenario look like? I think we desperately need that scenario to play out, and I'll tell you why. Because the U.S. left, uh, like many lefts, uh, have very little room for maneuver. They have very little uh, room to breathe. And a Bernie Sanders presidency will certainly not usher in socialism, not by a long shot. We'll face a tremendous amount of challenges uh, from all sides, and we can talk about that uh, in uh, you know throughout the course of, of, of our chat here. But there are many things – You know, the, the American executive is an extremely powerful office – uh, it was crafted that way in the U.S. Constitution. It's become ever more powerful ever since. Uh, George W. Bush infamously expanded the, you know, the authority of that office. And so should Sanders uh, be elected, which is an uphill battle, let's be honest about that. We're jumping the gun here. Uh, he would have tremendous authority to reshape the cabinet and immediately usher in a set of reforms and, uh, you know, sort of democratize those institutions in a way that would open up space for movements on the ground, much, much needed space, a uh, right to strike, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, we could see, um, obviously, he could, he could write off uh, student loan debt with, with the stroke of a pen uh, via exec executive order. Uh, he could vastly realign the United States relationship with the rest of the world. Um, you know, change the 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 face of American militarism instantly, reshape uh, various trade arrangements. Uh, you know, those types of things. Mm -hmm. And um, there will be and there will be confrontation, right? So even in the best case scenario, no there will be confrontation. And the good thing, I think, if you're selling the case for Bernie uh, on honest, realistic socialist grounds, it's that. Uh, he is already talking about confrontation to a certain degree, uh, which is obviously yeah. a complete break with the recent past, but also looking towards the future is absolutely essential. That that needs that consciousness of a coming confrontation needs to be built in. It can't come as a sudden surprise. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about, I guess, a little bit further on about what the role of, of consciousness is here and in terms of expectations as well about how to what degree one invests hopes and so on. We want to avoid the avoid the possibility of, of demoralization, which we're going to come on to. But let's continue spell, uh, spelling out this scenario um, in which Bernie succeeds. So let's say there's an uptake. I, I guess the argument for a uh, what is something which is a, a purely political phenomenon as as opposed to a social one is precisely that the political might bring into being the social, which is to say that a Bernie presidency might actually lead to. Uh, an increase in labor militancy, for instance. I mean, how does that play out in, in your imagination? Like I said, there's a tremendous amount of power the American executive uh, office has. They can uh, change the face of the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, uh, which has recently handed down a, a terrible defeat to the, some of the unions that had gained uh, some recognition in, say, graduate student and, and um, adjunct faculty, uh, contingent faculty in universities and, and colleges. Um, so he has a tremendous amount of power there. He can, uh, you know, authorize and protect the right to strike, which right now is most desperately what the labor movement uh, needs. It's not that there is, isn't uh, the desire to strike, as, as many have written. Uh, Joe Burns has written quite a, quite a lot about this for Jacobin and Labor Notes and elsewhere. 
it's not a you know a lack of desire to strike. It's the 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 lack of tools and the lack of infrastructure uh, to give people the confidence that they can strike, fight, and win. <clears throat> do you think he would, Adam? So do you think he would actually do these things? I think he would do this uh, certainly for labor. He's been uh, an incredible friend to labor. Um, th- I think the the labor part would be the easy part. My question is, and this is the, this is where I, I put the responsibility on us as socialists, because I think we are going to be, we need to put the, 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 the burden on ourselves. Um, what are we doing to lay out these plans? And I, you know, I've been doing some interviews on, on DPS over the past few weeks with these uh, socialist policymakers who, who are proposing various plans for employee ownership. And, and of course, those are fraught with contradictions and problems, as any good Marxist would understand. Um, but but the real question remains: What what is Bernie Sanders, uh, President Sanders, going to do at the fucking U.S. Department of Agriculture on day one? Mm. Right. So actually, this what, this raises a, a yeah. related question. And again, sort of being realistic, what's the worst case scenario for Bernie? What should we? Uh, so this is assuming that he becomes president, so he doesn't lose the primary to Biden or to Williamson. I think she's one one to watch. Certainly, um, <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't lose the presidential election to Trump. So he gets he gets he gets voted in. Obviously, expectations are going to be very high. There's going to be hope with the capital H. We've seen this before with Obama, of course. Um, What is what is the worst case scenario? Is it um, some pushback from the capitalist class? Obviously, this will happen. Is it him selling out and disappointing his supporters? Is it a demobilization of his supporter base? What what do you think we should uh, or what are some of the, the scenarios that we should take seriously um, if he does become president? I think the, the series of effect is is real here, potentially. When you have a, a radical government that, that enters state power, you do have a, you potentially see a demobilization of, of the resistance in broader society that enabled, uh, that produced the social base for that power in the first place. Um, you could see a recession. I think that's the biggest threat. If, if we're looking historically, uh, the, the United States has had remarkably long business cycles over the over the past. Uh, they've been artificially inflated, of course, uh, ever since Greenspan. Um, and and a, res- a, a deep and serious recession looks to be inevitable on the horizon. And so I fear that uh, Sanders, a lot of Sanders policies are inflationary, but they do require at least to some extent a booming economy. To pull off, which is one of the key contradictions of social democracy, right? You have to uh, make make friends with capital in order to produce the conditions of capital accumulation, so that you can, you know, uh, produce and, and fund that that uh, generous social welfare state. Um, I think a recession is probably the biggest the, the biggest threat. The mm-hmm. second threat would be the existing civil society. These people are career bureaucrats <laughs> in Washington D.C. and all across the world. Uh, they're, they are socialized into a certain, uh, you know, a certain set of ideas and opinions about how government should work and, and the way that, that institutions should, should operate. And so producing, uh, you know, <laughs> tens of thousands of, of new civil servants who are, you know, mm. um, indoctrinated in this new way of doing things overnight. So just to to push you maybe a little bit on this, um, is it too easy for us to say if Bernie fails, it's because of a recession, it's because of factors essentially outside of his outside of our control? Um, is is that too too much of a um, a, a pre made excuse potentially? I, I think that in some senses, I mean. I'm trying to think through this. I mean, part of it is that I, I just don't see anything else on the table. I guess the question for me would be, what else would we do as the mm. U.S. left that could produce better results? Mm. And this, to me, just seems to be the only game in town. And so, this is less about me being, you know, a, a mindless Bernie Stan, or you know, uh, ha- being Pollyannish or having rose-colored glasses, as much as it is that this is the game. And I think the, the question that socialists need to ask is, how can we push this limited project? Uh, as far as we can. Right. My concern, and, to be honest. Yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah, no. So, I mean, to roll back a second just to the question of, of a recession, because there, to put a point on it, you have a situation there where 
the proceeds of, of profits are, are not able to be distributed. And there, the, there's already going to be a degree, a significant degree of confrontation in a Bernie presidency. Uh, you might imagine, for example, a capital strike happening. If there is a serious recession, that would necessitate the sort of confrontation, which I just, I just don't think the level of uh, organization amongst labor uh, uh, is, is sufficient to actually see that through. In, in any kind of victorious sense. And anyone would imagine that Bernie then in the presidency would be relatively isolated and would probably capitulate in such a situation. I mean, I, again, just thinking this through. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I think you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And this is, this, these are one of the key, this is the key contradiction of uh, fighting for some kind of socialist transition in and through the capitalist state, such that you're, you're riding, a, you're, you're tied to a bull that's you know that that your fate is is tied to the fate of the bull, and you're trying to escape, you're trying to leap off at the right time uh, before the the bull dies out of the bull's capitalism. In this really, <laughs> I don't know. If you guys are yeah, no, no. Bull just, it's, the bull's always but, capitalism. Uh, it's, it's fine. Yeah, my my, my metaphors are are, uh, are always shaky. Listeners of DPS will know that. Um, but that's just to say that. Um, I do think the weakness of the labor movement right now in the United States is that it will be uh, Sanders' biggest threat. And he's going to need to make up some some ground on that. He's going to need to give them uh, the tools to be successful and to let the, the, the these militant layers rise to the top inside of these unions and really express themselves uh, over and beyond these these more, uh, you know, Clinton era bureaucrats who are who are more likely to to sit in, in back rooms with lawyers and, and go through, you know, years of litigation rather than use militant strike tactics. Right. I mean, obviously, our point here isn't to be fatalistic or to stand on the sidelines going, well, it's obviously going to fail uh, and to claim credit for having said so. I mean, that isn't at all what we're interested in doing. On, on the contrary, what we want to do exactly, and something that we've discussed uh, on maybe a bit, little bit more indirectly in previous episodes, which is that the situation today at least gives the left the possibility of failing in a, w- in a way in which over the 90s and 2000s, it didn't even have that. So I guess the question is then, imagining that Bernie does fail, well, Bernie will fail in the sense that if your objective is socialism, Bernie will not deliver that. Um, even in even an eight year Bernie presidency will not deliver socialism. What it might do is lay the seeds uh, for the possibility of a d- greater degree of class consciousness in the United States, uh, taking the boot off of labor's neck and allowing for the possibility of greater degree of labor organization. All these positive things, right? Um, and we're going to talk about the international scene as well uh, in just a little bit. But I guess the question then is, how do we learn from Fader? Im- imagine that Bernie then... Uh, does capitulate on certain grounds, but there's some progress on other grounds. W- what is the process by which one learns from failure? How How is demoralization avoided? Or even worse, because this is, I think, possibly an even greater danger, that very limited gains under Bernie are reinterpreted as the greatest success and some great, vi- and then ultimately it, it is a victory for American liberalism and not for socialism. Right. I mean, there's, there's no question that even in the best case scenario that we're, we're outlining here that, you know, Bernie could be somehow remembered as, you know, the second coming of FDR and, and sparking, you know, the proud, proudest traditions of, of American liberalism um, still wouldn't be a bad thing. Uh, I think people, uh, billions of people across the world would benefit tremendously from that. We can talk about that in a minute. Um, I think that rather than maybe thinking through this in terms of capitulate, what's he going to capitulate on? I think maybe we, we re, 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 refocus this conversation in terms of thinking about the question of sequencing. How do you sequence uh, uh, this kind of project? What has to come first? What do we prioritize? How do we convince people that this is what's happening? And how do we stay true? How do we stay on course and stay true to the project when you know you might win a few victories here and there, and people lose the stomach uh, for for the fight. Um, so the question, I don't know. I mean, does that make sense? I think. What, what, I mean, what do you guys think in terms of reframing this from a capitulation? Like, what is he going to have to capitulate on? Will he be defeated? Versus, how do we sequence this thing in terms of what has to come first to produce the capacities in order to produce uh, more robust and radical forms of, of struggle? This is really the the non-reformist reform tactic, which is well, you know, right. exactly exactly that because 
the issue is we're um you know it's kind of dreaming big in this podcast or right in this particular podcast in this particular discussion but at the same time trying to dream <laughs> dream realistically and there's a basic contradiction right there right yeah right right I think that I don't you, you guys uh, I did an interview with Joe Guinan uh, a couple of weeks ago. He is with the Democracy Collaborative. He just wrote a book with Christine Berry um, called People Get Ready, trying to prepare for a Corbyn government. And one of the ways that he frames this question, I think, is is really interesting. And I sort of steal the sequencing from him. And that comes from a lot of Corbynites. Um, I suspect that a couple of you guys will have something to say about this, which which would be good. I think it's right. You know, trying to trying to dream, setting the goal of dreaming realistically is yeah partly yeah. partly absurd, and also we're very self consciously sort of jumping the gun. But we're trying to spell out what the case would be, and also, I mean, I guess yeah. the, the, also yeah. the well, trick to is map precisely out, to map out political scenarios. Right. right I mean, exactly. Yes. 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 Okay. But, but also yeah, as I an a, also as an activist, as an intellectual, uh, and also in terms of mediating with activists and uh, the, the greater mass of people, that you've got to. You've got this kind of contradictory situation where you want to, if you want to build the case for Bernie, you want to invest hopes in it, while at the same time being realistic enough that you don't have people being completely demoralized when it fails, right? Yeah. Right, so right. It's, it's, so it's, I think I think yeah that's there, there's a there's a key educational component here that that the U.S. left is really behind on, and I look at what's going on and say the world transformed. In, in Britain and in other places across the world, the, the way that they're having these serious conversations about what it means to take state power, uh, building building p- bases of power at the grassroots, popular power, uh, how, how to hold governments accountable, um, having these interactive debates where you, you have FaceTime with one another and you build these meaningful kind of tangible connections with other socialists and other activists. It's, it's really irreplaceable and it's not happening on, in, in the U.S., Possibly because the United States is just fucking – it's a big country, right? It's a big country. It's hard to get people in the same place um, in the same way as maybe in Britain and the world transformed. The little anecdote I had uh, just a moment ago that I lost was that Joe Guinan and Christine Berry talk about in their book, People Get Ready. This notion that that you know people think about when you think about non-reformist reforms. They go back to Andre Gortz, uh, maybe Togliatti, uh, all the rest of those types of guys. Well, he they go back to uh, Thatcherites. Which is really fascinating. And I can't remember the, the individual, but one of the Thatcher's leading uh, strat- strat- strategists uh, sort of framed the question in terms of what are the industries that we need to focus on now so that, that future struggles are, are more winnable? What are the tactics? What, what, what are the moves that we make today that make the larger, more ambitious moves of tomorrow more achievable? And that's the question of sequencing. And, um, of course, as, as good socialists, good Marxists, we need to, to think and, and make battle plans about the contradictions of each move, knowing that there will be reactions in various ways. Sometimes you have the contradictions of, of uh, success as well, um, not just failure. So, yeah. I, think the, I mean, the issue, the issue here is um, that the – and this has happened, I suppose – I mean, this leads on to the next issue, but this has happened consistently now – with the European um, left is that it has crashed on the rock of the European Union. And so all the Western European, all, um, you know, all Western European countries confront that same issue. And it looks like the Labour Party is about to confront it too. Now, I don't know if there is a similar central political question in the US, which is also being evaded by the left to the similar degree. But I wanted to put it to ask you then to get your thoughts on this. What would be the effects of a Bernie presidency on the rest of the world? Mm. Um, how might what would be the knock on effects and implications for other countries and other people elsewhere? Uh, Leo Panish and Sam Ginnett's making of global capitalism uh, makes a, a really foundational claim here. I think it's really important to understand how how uh, central it would be to see even a milquetoast social democratic government at the helm of the, you know, the, the government of the United States here, which is that the process of neoliberalization, uh, neoliberal, uh, neoliberalism uh, coming out of the 1970s and into the 80s, uh, and even, in, even before that in the 60s, the, the break with the gold standard, uh, required that if the American empire was to maintain its force and the strength of the dollar and all the rest of it, that the domestic labor inside the United States needed to be disciplined. 
that in order to have this powerful, expansive economic and political empire abroad, you needed to be able to discipline labor at home. And you need a very strong state to do that. And it's, it's this really complex and fascinating way that the American state uh, evolves therein with this kind of a Janus-faced project. On the one hand, projecting its power outward and improving the prospects of of its citizenry inside the you know the the boundaries of the nation, uh, but also disciplining labor in order to pull that off. And there's some really complex monetary and economic uh, structural <laughs> issues that that require that that type of relationship. But what I'm suggesting is that if American labor finally gets the boot off its neck and and shakes the yoke of this discipline that has been uh, placed on them since the since really the late 1960s. I think you're going to see a reconfiguration of of uh, uh, the Americans uh, imperial uh, projects uh, abroad necessarily so you're going to see that the dollar is not going to be able to play the role that it it has traditionally and you're clearly going to see a reconfiguration of its military uh, power under a Bernie so Sanders would, presidency would, would this be then effectively a continuation of the trumpian politics so you'd say um, restraint with regards to the imperial war machine, an emphasis on protecting borders, Bernie's famous line about um, open borders being the Koch brothers' plan, um, an emphasis on protectionism and tariffs perhaps to defend particular industries, um, more of a turning inwards rather than engaging outwards of the globalist Clintonite era. Would there be a continuation, do you think, then of that kind of Trumpian line in foreign policy? I would reject the premise that the Clinton – I mean I know you didn't mean this, but that the, the, the Clintonites somehow own uh, the the notion of being this outwardly focused internationalist uh, you know, approach uh, to foreign and economic policy. I think there's, there's, there's at least one other way to do that, <laughs> which is to try to empower uh, nations and respect the sovereignty of other, of other countries and in terms of allowing them uh, to operate – you know, and 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 pursue various policies and outcomes that are in their benefit rather than uh, the benefit of American imperialism. And I think that that's something that Sanders would do. Certainly, that Trump would not. Um, I think that I think that the question of borders and protection protectionism is is one that is far more complex than anyone certainly myself, is able uh, to really think about, think through and, and outline in any serious way. I think this sort of open versus closed borders debate really skirts a lot of much more fundamental political questions that go back to fucking, you know, uh, Greece, for God's sakes, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, legitimate representation, uh, democracy, who belongs, citizenship. These questions all sort of revolve around the way that we understand borders and sovereignty and um, these other more complex notions. And so I don't know. I'm not really I'm not really happy uh, narrowing Sanders into this paradigm of, of, of protectionism versus open borders. I guess. No, right. And I think in any case, what you were getting at was something different, which is that changing labor relations in the United States would have an impact on. Uh, not just US, U.S. foreign policy, but also in terms of U.S. corporations, for example, and their relationship to uh, and their ability to operate in the international order, the effects on the dollar and so on. I think what is interesting, I, you know, looking at this from Brazil, for example, at the end of the day, if I, I, I don't even care what the case is for Bernie, even if Bernie ends up like I, I'm, I'm being kind of glib about this. But even if, if Bernie was like the the worst kind of. Um, liberal sellout in the presidency that would still be really good for Brazil and the rest of Latin America and for large swathes of the rest of the world, which would be well preferable yeah. uh, to to certainly to a Trump presidency um, and and probably and even more so probably to 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 a Biden presidency. Though maybe we could discuss that. I don't know. I mean, I'm uh, I'm I'm less um, I'm less sure of that. I mean, I remember the kind of um, the star power that Obama had at least in his first term in office. And I think it's, I mean, and obviously he's a very different kind of character, a kind of sleazy Harvard lawyer Mandarin type. But nonetheless, I mean, I think the kind of the um, the turning outwards to uh, imagining the great strides are making are being made abroad is a congenital problem for the left. And I think it would be it would be very easy to fall into that um, looking to a 
uh, Bernie presidency um, from outside for people to think to avoid their own problems. And I think it's particularly strong with um, with America. I mean, you see it with Trump in reverse, right? Everyone um, everyone kind of lets their own governments and elites off the hook by going on about how terrible Trump is. Um, and that's really striking. And I don't know that it would be particularly healthy for any country for that politics to happen just in reverse. Well, I'm not arguing that it would be something that you would actually actively strive for, not least because people in Brazil or Argentina or anywhere else don't have any say over who becomes president of the United States, and no one's pinning their hopes on it either. The point is merely that just thinking through what the scenario is, right, thinking, plotting out what scenarios look like, is that a Bernie presidency would, no doubt, one, provide a much better force of example um, in terms of... Uh, empowering similar politicians, similar political forces in Brazil, for example, uh, while also limiting uh, kind of imperial incursions. So, yeah, I mean, I suppose my question, I mean, uh, the question that I was pushing you on, Adam, was um, Mm -hmm. in a way you can see Trump is um, continuing some of the Obama themes, right? I mean, Obama campaigned on um, on criticizing the Bush administration's nation building and militarism. And then he didn't pull back, you know, and closing Guantanamo and all of that. He also campaigned on um, shifting the, you know, p- the famous pivot towards Asia. So already he was anticipating some themes which had been picked up by the Trump administration. So I suppose what I'm getting at is how far these are underlying shifts that are given a particular hue and a particular color by different administrations. But in fact, there are forces that are at work which um, are to some degree independent of the occupant of the White House. So to that mm-hmm. degree, a Bernie presidency would yeah. look different, but it would be it would be part of the same phenomenon of which Trump is the which is to say the breakdown of neoliberalism. And Trump mm-hmm. is part of that, too. Yeah. OK, I, I see. I see more what you're saying here. Uh, that, that's I mean, and these are fair concerns and these are these are concerns that should haunt every every principled socialist, certainly in the U.S. and, and even globally. Um, the question there is, I mean, here, here's what Bernie, I think a Bernie presidency would do, maybe not on day one, but within the first couple of weeks. OK, um, would cut off all U.S. support for Saudi Arabia's uh, military campaign in, in Yemen and elsewhere would vastly reorganize the the power block that has existed in in the Middle East and in North Africa for a very long time. Um, this axis that sort of uh, rotates around Saudi Arabia and, and Israel. Um, now, I'm not sure what that would look like, and that really raises the, 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 the key question. I think in Central and South America, you would see a, a serious reorganization of that axis of power in terms of uh, who is prioritized, um, who is threatened, who is sanctioned, who is all the rest of it. And as Alex has laid out, that would have tremendous benefits for a lot of people. But your question, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a much more sort of underlying structural question such that um, these, these relationships aren't just ideological, they're materially driven. And uh, certainly the U.S. empire is not going to uh, take its ball and go home overnight. Uh, <laughs> uh, there are far more powerful interests that uh, won't let that happen. So the question then is how do you reorganize this thing on a much more humane basis? And that's something that, that uh, will not be done in a four-year presidential term. I'm not sure that it could be done in eight years. So I think I think your concern is is warranted. Um, how long will this type of reorganization uh, require? And I don't know. It's massive. I mean, you're talking about an, a total reconfiguration of of, of global ge- geopolitical and economic order. And yet, and I mean, and, I guess. Sorry, go ahead, Phil. Go ahead, Phil. Uh, well, just to say, I mean, I suppose it's happening already, but to some degree, spontan- spontaneously, the breakdown right. of uh, yeah. the breakdown of the current order and. To that extent, um, Bernie and Trump, I suppose, are different symptoms of that to some degree. And the question is how far these trends can be consciously shaped and intervened in. Um, yeah, yeah. But that that gets to the question of American exceptionalism, because uh, my Ray, you know, I just mentioned before about the fact that uh, left populists in the in the European Union are all shat, all seem to me to be shattering on the rock of the European Union. Um, they're all unable to confront this central question. And the Labour Party now looks on the brink of some kind of either capitulation, um, either they'll overthrow Corbyn or there'll be some kind of capitulation to um, the European Union in our struggle to extricate ourselves from it. That's a separate debate. But the question, I guess, is um, how far the American left 
is has more opportunities by virtue of being in America itself. So that doesn't conf- it the virtue, the power, and um, the wealth of America's position as a state mean that the American left is still in a stronger position than say the Greek left, the Spanish left, the British left, the German left, the French left, all of whom are um, uh, certainly on the back foot, if not completely in retreat and disarray. Well, that was the I think the central claim that that came out of Panitch and Gittin's the making of global capital. One that I found very compelling then, and still more so now. Apologies for the very shoddy gloss of the arguments in that book. People should no, no, but if it, they haven't already. And, and, and people <laughs> should also listen to uh, your episodes that you've done with Leo Panitch and with Sam Gittin separately, because uh, both are excellent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, Leo's recently done the circuits uh, with some of our colleagues and comrades in uh, in Britain as well. Check those out. But I think the the, the real takeaway there is um, the, this reconfiguration of of global empire following World War II, uh, wherein the American capitalist state remade the world in its own image. Uh, one of the entailments there, the key strategic entailments for socialist struggle, is that uh, the fight back has to happen inside the belly of the beast. And uh, which is why I think even this very limited, you know, movement, this Bernie Sanders movement, which you know, by all measures doesn't really pass muster uh, on, and, uh, when it doesn't tick a lot of boxes for for real serious principled Marxists and socialists. But nonetheless, having, to, you know, with the potential of take, taking place here in the United States, I think it completely is a game changer. So I think I, I do agree with that. I'm not sure if, if, if that's what you were suggesting, Phil, but I do think that. Uh, there is a, some kind of American exceptionalism here that is that is justified, um, such that we do have the powers and the capacities to withstand a tremendous amount of uh, fight back and flux, and in, in in ways that other countries like Greece or Portugal or Spain uh, simply do not. Well, that's good stuff. I think as a way of rounding this out, maybe we could draw it even a little bit further and talk about something which uh, we've interacted briefly on, on on Twitter about this. But, you know, that neoliberalism is basically on the ropes, but that we're in this strange interregnum. You know, we call it the end of the end of history, where neoliberalism is clearly very weak, certainly more even in, in political terms than in economic terms, in the sense that uh, the, the its its flagrant lack of legitimacy is there for everyone to see, and yet no one's able to really seize the initiative. No one's able to uh, take charge to topple it. Nor is there a growing uh, conflict between opposing social forces, which takes struggle to to a higher, uh, more conflictual level. Instead, things just seem to muddle on. You know, there's uh, various populist breakthroughs here and there. And yet things just kind of seem to carry on. Uh, the, the sort of neoliberal establishments get even wackier, even more hysterical, even more deranged, and yet are unable to find solutions to, to, to the problems. And yet they still rule, right? So, mm. I mean, I guess the, the possibility one is that, a re, in the, again, the best case scenario for, for a Bernie presidency is that he finally puts an end to that. But, you know, you, you, you are faced with the situation that... Uh, you know, I, I just saw the news today, right? The U.S. has has uh, had recorded, what is it, 122 consecutive quarters of uninterrupted growth, which is the greatest sequence ever recorded yeah. by, by the United States, which is mind-blowing because we are living in times which are really kind of depressed. And if you look at it in terms of productivity, labor force participation, you know, things are, are pretty shoddy, really. And yet this is the, the greatest period of uninterrupted growth. So the room for maneuver is very limited. And, you know, if we're plotting... Uh, plotting out scenarios one is yeah maybe there's some sunny kind of uh, radicalized social democracy which might push us in a more progressive direction but then there's the other one where uh, you know for example under the influence of a of another economic crisis where things take a really nasty turn and become far more authoritarian because it's the only way for uh, capital to regain profitability after a crisis so yeah, yeah. maybe you want to comment yeah. on that yeah, I think this builds on Phil's provocation earlier, which was a which is an important one, which is, you know, are uh, Trump and Sanders the expression of the same crisis, just in different directions? And I think absolutely. Um, I'm, this is certainly not an original insight. Many of uh, many others have said this, but I think that um, the real promise and danger of our moment that we're living in right now is that we have this structural and systemic crisis. It's very deep and intractable, 
Um, how many different synonyms can I come up for a deep and intractable crisis? Anyway, <laughs> uh, it's very deep and intractable, you guys. And uh, I think only the far right and the far left uh, have proposed solutions right now. And, you know, the, the Trumpian sort of right wing populism poses that 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 problem in a certain way, which has certain resonances with the way that the far right, the far left rather uh, poses the question. Um, the center cannot hold, which, you know, for those who are get all jazzed up about radical politics, that should be a, an exciting prospect. But we know, Alex, as you just laid out, uh, the other option there is a, a right-wing authoritarianism, which we're seeing in parts of Europe and, and elsewhere and uh, across the globe. Um, yeah, what was the question? What, were we just sort of getting me to riff on that? I'm... No, I, Adam, I just had a quick a quick um, question here about whether we're being a bit too optimistic, because I think one of the mm-hmm. points that we started with is that the um, the recent upsurge in, in the American left is mainly changes um, or it's, it mainly draws its, its strength from from downwardly mobile um, middle class um, people. So, is there a, is there a sort of a, a potential fragility to to the to, to the to the left potential response to this crisis in that it doesn't have a mass um, working class mobilisation at its core? This definitely is the case in 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 Britain. It seems at the moment behind Corbyn. Um, so, I guess is there is is it quite finely balanced because it could it th- there seems like a, a number of different paths and the left path is not by any means guaranteed if it ever is yeah and there's a there is a there is a potential and then this has been implicit through, from through a lot of what you've been saying but there's a potential weakness here that there isn't a it's not a it's not a working class movement Oh, no question. And I don't know, had we done this call yesterday or tomorrow, you might have found me in a less optimistic state. You might have found me in a really pessimistic, kind of dark and brooding state uh, more more than I am now. I know I'm coming off a little Pollyannish. I think, yeah, I mean, th- yes, to answer your question very simply, yes, th- th- that's definitely a threat. I'm concerned about the nature of the U.S. left, what Adolph Reed Jr. calls, uh, you know, that which – at least right now, nominally and temporarily stands in for what will someday hopefully be a real left. Mm. Um, and that that's a real issue. But I do think that that um, the situation is progressing and and fast forward right now, sort of, mm. so to speak, and that people are are learning and developing and growing um, very, very rapidly. And um, I, it makes me hopeful. And I do believe actually because of the nature of structural power, I think, you know, uh, some people can sort of punch a, a couple of people can punch above their weight. Right. And that's we're in a position right now where this this random holdover from the the old new left, this, this curmudgeon from Vermont, <laughs> you know, just happened to be well placed. You know, it, the left as it existed since I've been a part of it over the last decade did nothing to earn this old curmudgeonly man who now speaks, you know, so authoritatively and authentically to the American people. Um, we were meeting in old dusty, you know, library, you know, rooms, <laughs> uh, mm. talking about the finer points of the, you know, the, the labor theory of value or whatever. And along comes Bernie Sanders in 2015 and completely transforms at least the rhetoric and the, the discourse of American politics. Um, so I have to just hope and believe that a couple of well-placed people can wield a structural power uh, that's not meant for them. Remember, mm-hmm. like, Trump broke this thing. He broke it. He wasn't yeah. supposed to work like this. A guy like Trump was never supposed to be in the uh, in the Oval Office. Yeah, and and, and now we, you know, and, and that's given Bernie an opportunity. We've now yeah. all come to look for America as his uh, use of the Simon and Garfunkel song yeah. in his uh, yeah. election videos says. Yeah, I th- and I think w- w- an important point to, to, to underline here, which I think Adam's hinting at as well, is that we, one, shouldn't forget how far we've come in the past three years. Um, obviously, that isn't to be complacent at all. But it's important to remember that, you know, the reason that, and you, you made reference to this, Adam, the reason that we started a podcast as well, and the reason that lots of different intellectual and political experiments started up in the past couple of years was because of this 2016 where suddenly loads of things happened and things accelerated very quickly 
um, as someone once said, you know, there's dec- there's weeks where decades happen, and that is something that we can, I guess, still hold on to because there there is a possibility that things ch- can change very rapidly. However, gloomy. Uh, however gloomy our analyses are right now about the the state of affairs and the limited room for maneuver. Yeah, yeah. I think I mean never get too high, never get too low. One of those kind of TED talky throwaways. <laughs> <laughs> right, I, I do this. I embarrass myself all the time. I show like you know my YouTube is like always like auto playing TED talks. I swear to God, I don't actually ever click on them. They just you know, show up on my computer screen. <laughs> but like I mean, but really, never get too high, never get too low on these things. I think it's important never to to give in to cynicism. Uh, yeah. But it's also important to never give in to these, um, you know, these almost messianic, uh, you know, highly <laughs> emotive. I mean, you think about the at the height of Occupy, at the height of Ceres' power, at the height of, you know, this wave or that wave. You feel like anything's possible and this is it, baby. We've made it. We're here. We finally mm-hmm. did it, you know. And it's like, no, not no, you didn't. <laughs> you know, calm down. Um, I think I think it's a, I think it's a Lenin quote, actually. Um, yeah, it's that, attributed that, to him. Uh, no, I, I, I've I, heard that, questions as to whether or not that was. Well, I, I, I was being, I was being kind of ironic, good. saying I, someone said oh, because yeah. oh, they're never too I, high. Yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah, I was sure. talking about the ne- never get too high, never get. Too oh high. right, yeah, that's a Lenin quote. Yeah, um, I can't remember the exact context, but not that yeah, weeks I, and years and decades. I'd say, I'd say it was Trotsky, but that. I'm pretty sure Trotsky was getting pretty <laughs> high in Mexico, and then getting pretty low due to an ice pick. Getting pretty low. Right. This is what we're all about here. A little, just a bit of psychic stability. That's what we're preaching. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, but 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 truly, um, I just one of the things that I'm pushing on my show, and maybe it's obnoxious. I don't know. Maybe people hate it. I'm just going to keep doing it anyway. I think it's important is that we really do need to shoulder this burden ourselves. It's on us. And I don't mean that in, in this kind of rah, rah way. I mean that in terms of a, a, a phrase that I, I raised to you the other day, Alex. Uh, it's something I may write about in the future. We'll see. Something called capitulation inoculation. Good coin. And that works, and that works in two ways. It works not only in terms of inoculating people from sort of throwing up their hands at the first sign of capitulation and, and taking their ball and going home, but it also works in the other direction as well which is inoculating those in power in the movements that are placed to to take power from actually capitulating. And it's a it's a double-sided uh you know pro- project I think wherein you know it's not just enough to say keep the faith dear masses we'll do the thing uh it's it's also not enough to say come on leader do exactly what I want or I'm taking my ball and going home it's developing a capacious and 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 a uh, serious movement um i'm kind of talking in general platitudes right now because you guys nobody's ever fucking done this before <laughs> No, but but this is but this is right. This is an important yeah. point to underscore that we've never been in this situation before. Yeah. There hasn't been such yeah. an interregnum as this one, truly, um, where social forces are so uh, disorganized. And you know, this goes for, this goes for capital in some senses as well. Um, that that they don't have solutions to to the crisis, and uh, you know, the left popular forces certainly don't either. And so there isn't. We really have to kind of make this up as we're going along. Yeah. It's true. I'll, I'll take that as a, a justification for these general platitudes. That I'm out. <laughs> That's great. All right, we might we might just leave it like leave it here with with some general platitudes. Um, so you know, guys, don't get too high, don't get too low. We're all good. <laughs> all right, cheers, Adam. That was a, that was great to talk to you. Yeah, thanks again, guys. I really enjoyed it. definitely write that thing on capitulation inoculation i think it's i think being sort of negative maybe it's the job of, of certain parts of the left including the, the podcast left um to explain the defeat or explain the explain the failure that we're going to see with bernie explain the failure we're going to see with with brexit um to so that next time we're in a 
a more realistic position in terms of the hopes and expectations of, of some of these opportunities. Yeah, yeah. My, are, are we right are we are we recording still? I presume. I mean, not. it's it's it, I I I never press stop as I as I explained earlier, but <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's officially over. But, it, but it's a wrap. It, it's a wrap. Yeah, we are. The wrap. NSA is listening, so we'll just we'll get their backup tape. So did you say the NSA or the DSA? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they have any party uh, ideological police just yet, but it's only a matter of time. Um, um, yeah, I think one of the biggest tragedies of a series, I'm actually thinking about launching into a series on series uh, very soon, a, a series oh, of series, if you will. That'd be great. Um, I have a couple, I have a book here from Costas Duzinas, who I need to get with. Um, there are a couple of really great comrades in, in, in Britain. Um, Phil and George, you probably know a couple of them. One of the guys, a uh, really good uh, comrade of Hillary Wainwright. I can't remember offhand. I'm losing it. Anyway, uh, I, I want to do a series on this because I think the biggest tragedy of series uh, is that we haven't learned the lessons. We haven't really yeah. even... even um, because uh, they're fucking Varoufakis. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's the GM25. Uh, clearly the way forward. I was actually intrigued by the episode you did with Leo Panich, because I instinctively disagreed with, with what he was saying at the end, but he was you know, suggesting that basically a, 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 a unilateral exit um, and the creation of its own cursing would have been a disaster for Greece, and it would have been such a negative example in terms of leaving the European Union that no one else would ever attempt it, which is, you know, I think something that has, it's, a, it's, a, it's an argument that has to be dealt with and can't just be brushed away as well. You know, you have to do it. Like, yeah. 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 Well, they're going to make you pay if you stay in. Yeah. And they're going to make you pay if you leave, doubly, probably. Let's be honest. Um, they're going to make an example of you and make you look like a whipped, uh, you know, dog lapping at the bowl, of, you know, at their feet if you stay, like Cyprus is doing right now. Yeah. And if you leave, you know, they're they they need they're going to try to make you pay doubly. And um, in, in that, I mean, I think that's just that's just that's a fact. The question is, um, were the capacities in place uh, to avoid the worst aspects? of that punishment yeah that's um, right and i think also i mean there was there's one part of this is overlooked that it was also an internal power struggle within the within the german government itself um schäuble uh, the finance mm -hmm. minister at the time who's more of an arch federalist he was willing to pay the greeks effectively to leave in order to be able mm -hmm. to actually consolidate the eurozone with um, a weak economy out mm. you know Whereas yeah, Merkel, yeah. Merkel wanted to keep the Greeks in, but also keep the EU more decentralized, and so was unwilling to pay them to go. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not simply kind of um, the choices the Greeks made, but also reflected a power yeah. struggle about the future of the Union within German within the German state itself. Mm -hmm. And those are the rifts that are opened up, kind of. Um... I almost said tangentially or or um, unintentionally. I mean, but but these are the rifts that open up in the course of of struggle and one of the things i wish i would have said this in the show is way i'm always way more articulate as soon as we press stop oh, yeah that's, that's fucking the way it goes man <laughs> jesus christ i i actually save up all my best points for the for the, <laughs> the end of it yeah so you don't, you I mean, don't want to give them to the to the like the, no, the, the people don't the pay pigs podcast. don't deserve it they don't no, deserve exactly it. um what i think i said i think i said is that you know um Neoliberalism has been so intractable, not because of its strength, but because of its uh, of of the systemic inflexibility of capitalism, and because it's rigid, uh, it can be broken. And you know, the EU, as you said, is increasingly uh, rigid. And global capitalism and neoliberalism is increasingly rigid. You have to believe that rifts will open. Uh, the question is, are we going to be placed with the capacities necessary to forge a different path? Um, and that's that's fucking huge, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't what, I don't know. I mean, I, yeah. yeah, no, but I mean, these guys will obviously go on about Brexit more than I even will. But, you know, it's, it's right that <clears throat> because of the coordination problem that, you know, Greece would need allies if it left uh, the EU and there were openings to Russia. And, you know, that's the, the UK is probably best place because one it's not in the euro. So it doesn't have that severe rupture in terms of leaving, you know, having to. To, to return to its own currency, it already has that. Uh, and and in terms of its economy, I mean, however unbalanced it is and weak in terms of productivity, it's still a better place than than probably than any other country in the EU to leave um, and to try to make a success of it and to provide a positive example. Um, so yeah, it's very true. Yeah, very yeah. true. Man. Let me ask you this then. Uh, I should have I should have thrown this back at you, Phil and George, because you guys are far more insightful and knowledgeable about this than, than I am. 
But one of the the key concerns, obviously, with a Brexit, uh, particularly under Corbyn, is it will put them right back under the, the you know the boot of of the U.S. dollar and, and American trade deals. Um, how would that change with the sand? How would that potentially change and and loosen under uh, Sanders presidency? Do you think? Ooh. I mean, would a left Brexit be more appealing, more uh, achievable <laughs> if if you've got uh, Jezza and 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 Bernie, you know, yucking it up behind closed doors. You know, I never actually thought about it. I mean, I think most of the um, most of the discussion. I mean, the discussion about trade deals with America is extremely primitive. So, I mean, there's nothing about it which is particularly. Um, it's chauvinistic. The American corporations are going to come and raid our wonderful NHS, which is you know um, mm -hmm. holy of holies and cannot possibly be improved by anybody. Um, mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, also this all this nonsense about chlorinated chicken, the Americans, yeah, you know, and GM foods, the Americans are crude and stupid. Our food standards are so much higher. We're so much more sophisticated than these, um, you know, than these kind of uh, freewheeling yanks. So, I mean, there's nothing much but chauvinism. The detail, the actual kind of practical detail of what a trade deal with the states would look like isn't even really detailed in places like the Financial Times. So it's, and I don't know what difference it would make mm -hmm. having a different occupant of the White House either. It's a really good question. And I, well, I so you think it's a false it. premise? It's a false well, just, concern. The state remember, of the debate is poor, I think. That's yeah, as sure. far as I could really say. Remember that the, the vote to leave the European Union was in 2016. So people were not looking forward to the, to, to the 2020 presidential uh, yeah, quite so. change yeah. so it's but maybe we should take this more seriously because we're still we're still in and 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 bernie's it's bernie or bust and he's getting he's getting closer well and he, warren i mean like, warren made very clear her um opposition to brexit on the basis of pandering to the irish vote in in the states yeah. um you know so i mean there's that dimension oh, as well i didn't see that I, I, has bernie actually said anything about it, Brexit. Yeah, has it's a good question actually, has he? I would love to talk to people who know better. I wouldn't be able to report on it, but I'd be happy to tell you guys. <laughs> that's this is my think, frustration right now. These guys well, look, look, at, look at you, George, George and Phil, shit. looking looking for the U.S., looking to the U.S. for solutions to your problems. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, well, maybe Bernie will help us with Brexit. We can't do it ourselves. <laughs> Okay, okay. Well, I mean, look, like, I, you know, you're going to need allies. And when the EU, when they want to make, uh, when Brussels or Germany or wherever, you know, when they want to make examples out of you guys, it's, it's you're going to need a friend. <laughs> right, and, uh, right. There's yeah, no we, friend like the U.S. <laughs> no friend like, like Bernie air quoting about whatever he's talking about and the, the millionaires and the billionaires of the European <laughs> Union. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. so we... We we need to wait and and see what Bernie says, and then we can change our position. Um, yeah, we'll see if he him. gives uh, gives gives you guys permission to leave. Yeah. <laughs> well, believe me, there are some there are plenty of people in the Labour Party who would be happy to wait for it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, take uh, take the the decision off their backs. Yeah. yeah.